Egypt. All right, welcome everyone who is watching the recording. Um, we were just talking about what the general plan is for today. Um, we have a quiz this afternoon. It is again a 30 minute quiz open between um, 3 p.m. until 8 p.m. If you need um, uh, a shift in that time, please let me know and we can set that up. Um, oh, this is, I copied this over from quiz three. Uh, it is a combination of Canvas, so it is in Canvas with a one-page uh, grade scope upload. Okay, so um, similar format to previous quizzes, which um, basically has some, uh, some kind of a drawing or worked out problem for partial credit. Uh, it is covering the series of topics here um, out of chapter 16, basically 16.1 through 16.6. Um, so not including the relative motion acceleration, which we'll talk about today, although I would argue if you can understand the acceleration, the rest of these will probably seem fairly straightforward. Um, as in chapter 16, it just kind of keeps building on this general idea of um, relating angular to linear motion. Uh, <clears throat> so we'll do a review of 16.7 here shortly. I've created a, um, a PDF for the breakout. Let me go ahead and paste in the link. So that's the direct link to the PDF. And as you go to the breakout groups, you're welcome to, um, if someone wants to share that and you can annotate on it or you can all look at your individual ones. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> I just ate my lunch and guess we're still uh, not allowed to have my throat. Um, and so you're welcome to um, do that individually, annotate on a, a shared screen, however you'd like to look at that, but kind of talking through how we visualize these vectors. Um, as we talked about on Friday, I know not many of you were in the um, active session on Friday, thanks to those who were. Um, if you're able to visualize these vectors, I would argue that all of the math and all of the different details will make a whole bunch more sense. Um, so I'm trying each semester I teach this topic. Honestly, I focus more and more and more on drawing of the vectors, getting you to actually be able to physically draw them out. And if you can physically draw them out, the computations that you're making should make a whole bunch more sense. Um, <clears throat> and so we will go over this activity today and give you a chance to ask questions at the end. Also, feel free to ask questions as we go, okay? So um, as per usual, um, any questions related to the quiz or related to any um, logistical items or topics you wanna make sure that I hit today, anything else that we can help guide our interaction? All right, um, hearing none, let's go ahead and take a look. Oh, here we go, Zach. Um, tips for studying for the quiz. Um, the quiz, I wrote it a few days ago, so I don't even remember exactly what's on it. It's a few questions. Um, it is, it's, I'll, I'll say that it's not very computational. I won't say it's not at all computational, but um, and this is pretty common for quizzes just because, so in writing a 30 minute quiz for you all, I have to be able to do the quiz in less than like seven minutes and that's using a four to one scalar. Um, and so these problems can be very long, very involved. And so to try to make a quiz length, um, a quiz length assessment, I often need to keep it more to the conceptual. And so, you know, fully understanding um, how to draw the vectors for um, fixed axis rotation, how to um, find ICZVs, uh, mainly focusing on, well, any of the three rules we talked about in the notes. So um, contacting a non-moving point, having two parallel velocities with a 
bisecting line perpendicular to those velocities or non-parallel velocities, essentially extending lines from your velocity vectors perpendicular to the velocity vectors to a point of intersection. That's how we find ICZVs. Um, and then additionally, using relative velocity. Now realize that relative velocity and ICZVs are fundamentally doing the same thing. Um, the reason, to be honest, that I even go through all the cross products involved in relative velocity is that as we get into what we're gonna talk about today, which is relative acceleration, like there is no ICZVs for acceleration. So ICZVs can significantly trim down your amount of effort to find your linear velocities and angular velocities of an interconnected system of a linkage. Um, but, and then, but there's, there's no way to use ICZVs essentially to do that same shortening, that same truncation um, of relative acceleration problems. And so you'll see there, and you probably saw it, hopefully you've watched the, the videos which were posted on, um, on, on Monday. Um, but it's, you know, we still can do this, use the same mentality, the same framework to draw the vectors. Um, <clears throat> and technically, you still could find the components of those vectors using the geometry of the problem and magnitudes, like I said, or you can work through all the component um, cross products. Um, the nice thing is the normal acceleration is never a cross product because it's always just the product of a scalar in the negative R direction, but we'll, we'll show that too. So I don't have anything specific. Um, but certainly focus on um, drawing and conceptual and know that if there is anything computational um, that you have your equation sheet available, okay? So um, you don't have to memorize equations, but have a copy of your equation sheet available. That'd be my, my best guidance there. Um, all right, so relative acceleration, oh, we've got a flip here. All right, so relative acceleration, the structure is still based upon the same kind of a thing we're doing for relative velocity. It's just that we know that acceleration is the time rate of change of the relative velocity. And so fundamentally, what this means is that every single velocity term right, where we had velocity of A, velocity of B, and this relative velocity between them, gets split into a um, tangent and a normal acceleration term, okay? So this is really like this first page here was just the derivation of this working equation. Noting, once again, here's that normal acceleration, the relative normal. It doesn't matter if you're talking about a relative normal or an absolute normal it's always going to be on a rotating body, the omega of the body squared in the negative direction of your R vector, okay? So um, also just to highlight here that whatever R vector you feed into, so right here is our R vector, right? R of A relative to B. We're gonna use the same R vector in either our tangential acceleration or our normal acceleration in the same way that even um, A and B may be based upon an R vector. And um, so I guess the best way to say this is that your R vectors and either your velocity and or your acceleration components always match, okay? So if you're trying to find your normal acceleration of A relative to B, make sure you give it an R vector of A relative to B, okay? The same subscripts on that R vector. Um, we'll see in the examples that <clears throat> Excuse me. These acceleration components um, often come from rotation as well. The only time they don't is when you have like a slot or a basically a linear path that either A or B is following. And of course, in a linear path sense, you'll never have a normal acceleration. Um, and I, we can talk more about that related to this, the first kind of mapping problem. But the general structure <clears throat> um, the general structure of the relative velocity and relative acceleration equations, it's the same order. You just double the amount of terms because you have tangent and normal for acceleration. Okay, so to walk through one of these mapping exercises, 
Um, now there are times in the mapping, it makes sense and probably could have done it on this one to go ahead and separate like one drawing for your relative velocity stuff and one drawing for your relative acceleration. Um, in this case, I combined them both. All the purple terms are accelerations, all the brown terms are my omegas. Um, on this problem, and I'm trying to remember, I think I started with, like you can either start with motion on one end or motion on the other. So this problem either started with VB or it started with omega of OA. And to be honest, I recorded the video last spring and I don't remember <clears throat> which direction I started from. Um, I started with omega, great, thanks for that. Um, so if we start with omega, we know that OA is in fixed axis rotation, right? So therefore, my, the velocity of A is going to go in the same general direction this omega pushes it into. Now, another important thing to notice on these problems is to look at the direction of omegas and alphas. If your omegas and alphas match direction, then basically all of your tangential accelerations are going to match direction with your velocities, right? And that should make fundamental sense that if accelerations, so your angular acceleration, angular velocity are going in the same direction, your linear velocity and linear tangential acceleration are going the same direction on every single body, okay? And so um, it's really obvious to see that here for point A, just because A is in fixed axis rotation around O, but it also turns out to be true over here for the velocity of B and this acceleration of B. Now, I will say that I've run into maybe one problem out of 50 that this wasn't true, but the nice thing about that is that if computationally you're working that problem, you'll end up with a negative value for that acceleration and it will tell you that um, things are in the opposite direction. Okay, so as far as the mapping exercises go and your assumptions go, go with that assumption that if omegas match alphas, then Vs are in the direction of A sub Ts. I'm sorry, we have a question, Dr. Big. Yeah, um, you bet. So the way we found the omega of A sub B has everything to do with this ICZV. So I'll go through that here um, first. And so for right now, just kind of blur out the, all the purple vectors. Um, so, we did, so we were given omega, we just found V sub A. Um, we also know that V sub B is traveling along a horizontal line. Okay, at this point, we don't know if it's going left or it's going right, but um, let me actually draw this. It's a little bit less noise. The stylus for this tablet is round and it rolls around, and so sometimes it rolls away. All right, so let me just come down here. Okay, so to draw this guy out, I'll just do a stick figure. So from O to A to B. Okay, O, A, B. So we have our omega going in this direction here. Therefore, my linear velocity is gonna be perpendicular to OA, right, perpendicular here. Um, my velocity for B, I don't yet know if it's going to go left or right, but I know it's going to be horizontal. Okay, so I know that ICZVs are always perpendicular to velocities. Okay, so perpendicular to this velocity at A. And noting that ICZVs are always perpendicular to absolute velocities. There is no such thing, at least in dynamics, and there may be in dynamics of machines, but at this level of dynamics, you know, there is no ICZVs related to relative velocities, only absolutes, okay? So this is the absolute velocity of A, and the absolute velocity of B is horizontal. So doing another extension perpendicular to the velocity line tells us that our ICZV is right here, okay? And again, ICZV is the instantaneous center of zero velocity. It's also, you can think of it as the instantaneous center of rotation. This is the ICZV of body A, B. Every body that is not, that is moving, but not in pure translation has an ICZV. Um, the other ICZ in this problem for OA is the pin, right? Is the fixed axis pin over there at O. 
Once we have this velocity, the next thing you do is you look at this linear velocity of A, noticing that that linear velocity is rotating around the ICZV in a negative right-hand rule direction, right? Your, your thumb goes into the board, which indicates that our omega or AB is negative from the right-hand rule. It also then validates that the velocity for B has to be going to the left. The reason it has to be going to the left is if, it, if you had it going to the right, right? VB going to the right and VA going up here to the left, that would have to stretch AB to be possible, okay? And so we know that these are rigid bodies and we cannot uh, break or bend them to satisfy the motion. So B has to go right as A goes up to the left, okay? So that's the ICZV. One more time with the right-hand rule. All right, so as we think about the meaning of the ICZV, the instantaneous center, you can think about your instantaneous center as honestly part of that body, okay? So just drawing in a highlight here, now I'm really thinking about, hey, I've got like a, a de facto pin here at this, at this red plus point, and AB is rotating around that plus point, okay? So in order to have the velocity, my linear velocity here going up to the left, I need that body to be swinging around in this direction, right? And that direction, as you line your fingertips up with the, the direction that the arrow is going around and around is negative from the right-hand rule. Um, all right, so that basically, that's the mapping of velocities. So that's what we did um, for the learning exercise on Monday and um, we did in the um, active learning session on Friday. So we're gonna use the same flow, the same mentality to work through the accelerations. It's just that now we have both tangent and normal. To be honest, I typically on a problem like this would probably do my tangentials first. Not that I'm gonna, that not that I'm going to neglect my normal accelerations, but I know that if my alpha and my omega, right? So that was my omega in brown, and my alpha on this problem happens to match in the same direction, um, that all of my tangential accelerations, and so if you wanted to, you could just grow them right out of the end here and say, well, this is going to be my AA sub T, right? Just like this was my VA. And if my VB is going left, then my VB sub T, sorry, not V, undo, here we go. My acceleration tangential of B, okay, is going in the same direction. Additionally, alphas do the same thing, okay? So if my omega of this one is going this direction, it's a good assumption that my alpha of AB is going the same direction, okay? So you basically, omegas in the direction of alphas match your linear velocities, match your angular velocities. Now, normals always come back toward the center of curvature. There's only two normals on this problem. The first one is the fixed axis rotation normal of A around O. Okay, so this comes back toward point O. So this would be my acceleration of A normal. Um, there is no normal acceleration for point B, and that's because it has a linear path, right? We talked about this a lot with particles. Linear path does not require normal acceleration because the normal acceleration is acceleration to keep something moving in a, in a curve, and this is not moving in a curve. We do have a normal acceleration of A relative to B or B relative to A. Now, early in the problem, often when you write your, um, honestly, even when you, you know, you could, as you're laying out, even the fact that you write acceleration of A on the left-hand side of your equation, that tells you in kind of a chain of, um, and these are vectors, don't forget those vector signs, that we're gonna use the acceleration of A relative to B. And this acceleration of A relative to B is based upon R of A relative to B, right? Because all of my R vectors then feed into my velocity and acceleration vectors. 
And so, like I said, even at the point you write even this, the simplest of relative acceleration equations relating the acceleration of two points on body AB, you are at that point choosing your R vector, okay? So this R vector is gonna go of A relative to B. And so drawing that in space, that's gonna go from B up to A. So it's gonna go up this direction here. Okay, so this is R of A relative to B. All right, so this then points at point A, which is gonna be the point that both of our relative tangent and relative normal accelerations come from. These are the hardest two vectors you'll draw in this diagram. But know that your relative tangent is simply going to be this alpha crossed into this R vector, right? Isn't that the definition that our acceleration of A relative to B tangential is equal to alpha of that body crossed into R of A relative to B. A little sloppy, but that'll work. All right, so alpha is going into the board. R is swinging up from B to towards point A. And so these are gonna exist on a line perpendicular to the R vector. See if you can determine if it's going up to the right or down to the left. All right, alpha's going into the board. So my fingers slide into the board, I curl toward point A, my thumb goes up to the right. So this is my acceleration of A relative to B tangential. And then my normal is actually fairly easy. The normal always is opposite the R vector, right? R vector going from B up to A, therefore my R vector is coming back down toward point B. So this would be my acceleration of A relative to B normal. So when I mention a mapping exercise and writing out equations, this is the exact process. Um, I often call this a general equation, right? You can't solve anything from this equation, but it's the structure under which you develop a more specific equation, which has all the details you need to solve. Okay, so like I said, this would be a general equation. This would be your specific equation to solve a problem. And like I said, either one of these, and you can see that they both, let's see here. Oh, I, I, I was just noticing my acceleration here. I drew it, the arrowhead is still going up to the right. Um, I think just because I had my relative velocity also drawn here, um, I fit it in down below. But I was just double checking, I had all the same vectors. Um, what's in, it's interesting to look at my handwriting difference between using my Wacom tablet, which is what I'm using on my, oh, and then I touched the screen and all went haywire, um, down here, which really sucks. Um, and then the top one is using what I can actually look at the screen and write on at the same time. Um, anyways, um, so that's the general idea of mapping a problem. And then I think that if you can actually honestly do that first, then when you get into all these cross products and you end up going like, oh my gosh, a, a K hat crossed into a negative J hat, what do I get from that? All you have to do is like look at these different vectors, right? You can look at um, like your acceleration of A relative to B tangential, you know you're gonna get a positive I hat and a positive J hat out of the cross product. Um, the acceleration of A tangential, you're gonna end up with a negative I hat and a positive J hat. Right, so it can like help inform your cross products before you even get to performing any of the math because you've spatially understood. And I would also argue you've conceptually understood the framework that we're using to quantify the motion of this body. Because um, really what we're doing is we're kind of walking from you know, one end to the other using this relative motion framework. Can I say something, Dr. Baker? Yeah, go ahead, Arbiter. Um, so my point was like to distinguish between the absolute and the relative velocity and acceleration. So I see people, they don't know the distinction between the absolute and relative. So like if they start to take the point, like as per se, like we are on A, if you take the velocity of B, so they think that's the velocity of B rather than stating it's velocity of B with respect to A. 
So I've yeah. seen that. Yeah, and those relatives, they are the hardest thing to conceptualize, right? It's easy enough for most of us when you talk about an absolute velocity, you're like, I get it. I'm sitting still and I'm watching something move. Um, one of the best ways I think about relative velocity is, um, I know there's not a lot of merry-go-rounds merry around anymore. There's, of course, the ones with the horses and those that actually work as well. But if you're on a body that's moving and you're looking at something else that is also moving, and in this case, we're talking about another point on that same body, you have a relative motion between those two. So on a merry-go-round, if you're sitting on one side and someone else is sitting on the other side and you're looking at each other, it turns out the distance between you won't change, only the direction between you will change, right? And that would come back into our relative motion equation, which is right here. So essentially this term is the relative rotation of that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, of the velocity between you. <clears throat> it's interesting. I, I think I talked forcefully in statics today. My voice is like so not used to like three hours of, of lecturing during, during a normal semester. It's easy. I can have a question. Yeah. His hand, is, he raised the hand. So oh. I, I, I assume that he has a question. Great. Yeah, I missed the, I don't have my participant list up. Really, really simple on that last problem. Just to make sure there's, I'm not missing something, but if, when you're looking at A relative to AB in the N direction, yeah, right there, you're just based on the fact that it's just the negative R A relative to B vector, right? Like, okay, cool. Yeah, and noting that if we, if we flipped around our original equation up here and we went with B is equal to A plus B slash A, we would flip this R vector in the opposite direction the tangential and normal accelerations would then come out of B. That normal would go back up toward point A. And this tangential is going to be in the opposite direction. Because at that point, again, it's alpha crossed R. Alpha is still into the screen. Now your R vector goes down towards point B. And you end up with your thumb coming down to the left. Um, and so, like I said, from very early on, it starts to, it starts to predetermine not only um, which R vector you use, but also where those, those relative terms will come out of. Yeah, good question. Thanks for that. Um, other questions on relative acceleration? And I'll, I'll tell you that, and if you've opened up the PDF, you'll see that your exercise today looks exactly like this. <clears throat> the only one additional thing is on the exercise, um, I gave you, I think, both a four bar linkage as well as a, um, an additive motion, okay? So the main difference in an additive motion is that the, the motion of the outermost point is not constrained. Um, it's basically built upon your addition of motion of all of the inner pieces. And so in setting up an additive motion problem, I always put the point that's like the further, the, the unconstrained motion point on the left-hand side of the, of the equal sign. That way it's set up that everything on the right adds up to the motion of that point. And that the other thing to note is that the term that's on the left, because it's unconstrained and you don't really know what direction it's going in until you do all your math, you don't need to draw this one, okay? Because like I said, it's unconstrained. You don't know where it is, where it's going you can mathematically solve for it, but you can't spatially figure out what direction it's going before you do your math, okay? So a four bar linkage, we can fully map every single direction before we get started. In additive motion, um, you cannot map this, um, like I said, the, the, the outermost point. And so just to draw a diagram, so that would be A that's the furthest out that would correspond to that. If we had, say, a pin here, and that's hooked to an arm here. So if this is O, and this is B, and so another pin here, and this is rotating around point B, and this is point A, in our mapping exercise, don't even try to draw the, honestly, the velocity, linear velocity or linear accelerations of A. 
because they're complex and you can mathematically solve for them, but they're not physically constrained. But you can draw the absolute velocity and accelerations of B, and you can draw the relative velocity and acceleration of A around B. Okay? You can build out to that point. Um, noting that your omega and alpha of this outer body, um, and this was covered in the notes on a previous section, but your omega of AB um, is equal to your omega of OB plus a relative, if this is also rotating around point B, this omega of AB relative to OB. Okay, so a similar structure for as a linear relative velocity, but this is our angular relative velocity. And we have the exact same equation for our alpha. I won't take the time to write that out, but basically alpha of AB is equal to alpha of OB plus alpha of AB relative to OB. So the, you always wanna do all your computations with the absolute omega and the absolute alpha of AB. And so if you're given this relative one, make sure you add in your absolute of the inner body. And again, like I said, this is, um, one way you can think about this is that this is like throwing a baseball with your arm, right? If you don't move your shoulder, that's fixed. But you've got your upper arm that moves, so that would be like OB, and then your lower arm is AB. But when you throw something, I know this is three-dimensional, but I'll try to keep it two-dimensional. When you throw something, you're rotating your upper arm as well as your lower arm. Now, technically, you're also snapping your wrist, which becomes like a third relative motion onto the outside of that. We're not gonna get into that third body um, here in dynamics, but just showing you that um, that's how you can get such, there's a, a throwing spear called an addle addle um, that they actually used an extension bar from their hand and they'd be capitalizing on their upper arm, their lower arm with this extension bar and then the, um, the spear was hooked to the end so they could get really high throwing velocities with those spears. Um, but like I said, that's how you can, this idea of additive motion is like I said, exactly like your upper arm, lower arm and hand if your shoulder is a pin and your hand is in kind of that unconstrained motion at the end. All right, any other questions before I send you off to work on that, um, that PDF? Here's the link again in case you signed in late. And see, it's 33. We'll go with 10 minutes. Now, I know you may not finish in 10 minutes. I will talk through these. It'll only give me about five, seven minutes to do that, but that should be enough time. I'll talk through those at the end. And so I'll go ahead and open those rooms, give Harbinger and I a shout if you need any help. Um, I know there's a short amount of time to work through those problems, but um, hopefully you got, some, got in some good discussion. Oh, and I just noticed, that's right, I'll fix it as I go. Um, so on this problem here, um, I've basically laid out that we want to, this is a four bar linkage problem, C is in fixed axis rotation, E is a slotted pin. Mouse actually controlled this one. Why is that not working? That's all right. So, um, one correction I'm going to make here right off the bat is let me make sure that both these equations match. And I, I didn't, this was not intentional. I'd actually intended um, to go with, you know, D in the, the top equation and then also D in the lower one. So um, if we have D and we need to relate these two points that are on the same body, right? These equations, all the equations for 16.5 and 16.7, relative velocity, relative acceleration, have to associate two points on the same body. And it's always gonna be the body that's in general plane motion, okay? Not the body that's in fixed axis rotation. So that basically tells me here that I'm gonna have, this is point E, and then to make my subscripts cancel, this is point D, this is point E. And again, if you wanted to at this point, go ahead and draw your R vector, it is gonna be your R of D relative to E. Now the other R vector that you'll use is this R vector 
Now this one you can either write as your R of D or your R of D relative to C. C is not moving. And so this is an absolute position vector because fundamentally it's, it's, you're pointing at a point that is moving, but it's relative to a non-moving point. So that makes it absolute. Um, all right, so there's your R vectors. <clears throat> I'm going to draw the terms first and then I'll fill out my equation. And let's go ahead and I'll, um, I'll do my velocities in gray just so they don't um, stand out too much. So this would be like my velocity of D and my ICZV is going to be extension line to the velocity of D and then the velocity of E is somewhere along this line. So perpendicular to that puts my ICZV for DE actually up there on body CD. Okay, so again, that becomes the, um, the center of rotation at this instant for DE. And so if VD is going up to the right, then my velocity of E has to be going here also up to the right, just in confi confinement with that slot. Okay, there's velocity of E. Uh, Dr. Ever, can I ask a quick question? You bet. Um, just to kind of slow down for me, so the velocity of D, we found that because we're crossing that R with the uh, uh, omega, correct? That's correct. Crossing the R of D, or sorry, the omega of CD into the R of D. And then um, you then kind of skip over the velocity of E direction, but you know it's going to be somewhere in that panel, basically. Yeah, I know that it's going to be a long, I'm not quite sure my mouse isn't kicking in here, which I don't understand why. Um, I know that it's going to be along this line. I know that the velocity of E is going to be along this line because it's a confined channel that basically dictates the direction E has to go. Okay, but at first, I don't know if it's going up to the right or down to the left. Right. Now you certainly like, the way I used to just look at these is I would look at D and I'd think about the motion and I'd say, well, VE's got to be going up to the right. But using this ICZV, noting the right that this is the ICZV of body DE, right? The ICZV for CD is that pin. <clears throat> so once you find the ICZV, you can treat this pink triangle like a rigid body. So if D is swinging around, so I think I have a laser, where's that functionality? That's so weird, my mouse is like just not showing up. That's right. Um, so if point D is swinging around the ICZV in this direction, then point E also has to be swinging around in that same direction. Okay, why, so that, go ahead. Uh, why is the ICC, ICZV on the diagram and not off it? Like where did that hypotenuse or like come from? Cause it's not really following an angle that makes sense. Got it. The ICZV comes from being perpendicular to this velocity and this velocity. ICZVs are always at an extension line perpendicular to point velocities. And so, um, you know, if you change the motion or the slot out here at E, it will change where the ICZV is for DE. Because it's always gonna be perpendicular to the velocity of both ends. So the question is why it's on the diagram. It can be off of the diagram depending upon where the arm is situated. No, that was like my question. Down. That was just yeah. my phrasing of it. It's yeah. your answer. Okay, sorry. No. Okay. And there's another one. Why wouldn't the ICZV be at the intersection? Um, intersection. It is, but the intersection of what? So it's at the intersection of. I don't have any more highlighter colors. I can pick a different one here. It's at the intersection of um, this line 
which is perpendicular to VE, and this line, which is perpendicular to um, the velocity of D. Okay, so it sounds like you all need a little practice on ICZVs, which is a great thing to know, right? Just a great thing for you to, um, to pick up on with the quiz open till eight, you should have some time. So we are officially at time and I'm gonna leave that up to you if you guys want, we'll keep recording. Um, you are welcome to drop off, but I'm going to finish these two problems just for your benefit um, and talk through them. Okay, so we found our ICZV, we found our linear velocities. So now getting into what's actually 16.7, which is looking at our accelerations. We notice that this angular acceleration is opposite the angular velocity. Therefore, I can make the assumption that all of my tangential linear accelerations, my acceleration of D tangential, and over here, my acceleration of d, or sorry, this is not d anymore, this is of e tangential, are opposing the velocities. Now, I, I forgot to do one more thing while I was talking about ICZV. Let's go ahead and um, draw the omega, right? So if vd and ve are going in the direction they're going, my omega has to be positive from the right-hand rule in order to support those velocities. And if we're continuing with this assumption that the alphas are opposite the omegas, we can say, I'm assuming that my alpha of DE is in the opposite direction as my omega of DE. And again, I've seen one or two problems out of you know, maybe 50 or so that I've solved that either there was a sign flip, maybe alpha is equal to zero. There's really complex motion. I'll, I'll try to remember to post a link there's a great YouTube channel that this guy puts together all these really neat animations of linkage systems. And so what you'll see is that bodies will go to zero megas at certain points, um, that their alphas will actually be always speeding up and then they start slowing down. These are all the kind of things you'll look at in dynamics of machines. You'll actually use ICZVs in a whole different way um, in dynamics, not a whole different way, but in a, in, at a higher level in dynamics of machines. All right. So that maps my alphas, my tangential accelerations, I'm left with my normals. So my normal of D goes back toward the center of curvature. So here's my acceleration of D normal. And then my normal acceleration, oh, I need to do my relative tangential and my relative normal. Okay, so my relative tangential is going to be this alpha crossed into this R vector. Okay, so negative, swing my fingers over to the left, my thumb goes upwards. So this here is my acceleration of D relative to E tangential. And then my normal goes back toward the center of curvature. And so this one is the acceleration of D relative to E normal. As you can see, these diagrams end up with a lot of stuff on them. Please, 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 if you're submitting these, draw these large. I would, I'd, I'd love to see every one of these diagrams be almost the full width of your paper. Um, if you draw them small and you draw them sloppily, they're really hard to grade. And um, I've said this before, but a happy grader is a generous grader. Please make them as easy to grade as possible. Um, so yeah, start large, start with straight lines. Um, and start with accurate angles as well, as much as possible. Um, I did put a note, so there is not, not on accelerations in the quiz today, but there is some relative velocity stuff, which shouldn't be a huge surprise. Um, and um, I've welcomed you to actually screenshot the diagram and pull it over into your, if you're using software, or if you wanna print it and then scan that later, but get an accurate sketch to start with it will make your life and our graders' um, lives a lot easier. All right, so this would be the full map of all of the acceleration terms. And like I said, I did include a few of the velocity terms, VD, VE, just in gray. Questions on this one? Kind of going all the way back to once we found the ICZV, I actually get finding that. How did you use that 
um, to find the direction of VE? So I actually, um, the direction of VE has to match up with the direction of VD so it doesn't tear this body apart, okay? Because at that point, we're basically looking at this DE body, the, the yellow highlighted line um, horizontal. And so if VD was going up to the right and VE was coming back to the left, like those velocities would actually need to like shorten DE in order to be true. Like it would actually be impossible for, it, like oh, okay. you either end up with velocities that are gonna like stretch a body, which are impossible or compress a body. Both of those are impossible. Okay, I see that now. And then the other one that was really getting me was, I can't tell if I'm just like frazzled today or what, but when you have that VD, you have the RDE, how do you kind of like reverse the right hand rule to find that Omega DE. So there is no opposite right hand rule, or sorry, there is no like like a reverse operator for a cross product. There's two ways you can look at it. One is guess and check. You could draw your omega. You could cross from your ICZV. So um, so once you find your ICZV, you could draw this R vector from the ICZV down to point D, and you could check, hey, is a positive omega going to give me this velocity, right? Because V is equal to omega cross R. So that would be the guess and check. I think it makes more sense to think about this in a physical sense that this velocity, in order to push D in that direction, I have to rotate D in around this ICZV in that positive right-hand rule direction, right? That your linear velocities and angular velocities have to be harmonious in their motion, have to work together as opposed to like opposing each other. Okay, thank you. You bet, great question. All right, so that wraps up this one. Let's take a look at the additive motion. Oh, let me fill these in real quick. So the first two terms here are looking basically at D. So this is gonna be the alpha of CD. This is gonna be my R of D. This is also gonna be my R of D. So I'm basically keeping this, hold on, I did the wrong D, D. D relative to E, let me get my, do, 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 do. my brain really wanted to do the other direction. So let me fix this, okay. So there is no fundamentally alpha cross R for point E because there is no rotation of motion that causes that. And so I probably should have, have written it in this form because um, really you just end up with this acceleration of E tangential. And that's like the best you can do. You do know it's line of action. You know it's line of action is in the slot, um, but it isn't based upon a cross product because it isn't fundamentally a rotating uh, motion based upon rotation. So this is your AE normal and it's equal to zero because E is moving in a straight line, okay? So this is because E in straight line. Then we get into, these are our, our relative um, acceleration. So if this is DE here, this is going to be B slash E here, this is going to be B slash E here. And then it's just gonna be the alpha and the omega of that same body. And so this is of DE and of DE. So sorry for the misleading. Uh, like I said, this term here, there's really not an alpha cross omega. You would have one of those if you had another fixed axis body instead of this slot. But that's kind of the two different four bar linkages that we deal with. Um, is either having a slot on one end or an additional um, fixed axis rotation arm. All right, so moving on to the back, and I do have these matched up. Now, noting that if you have additive motion, okay, so this is this wheel and this arm, 
I always like to put my point that is unconstrained the furthest from the constrained pin on the left hand side of my equal sign. It just makes the most sense. You're adding up all the motion to get out to that point. And so the subscripts here would look like that this is going to be acceleration of A, and then this is going to be acceleration of B relative to A. And again, once you have that acceleration vector, you know you're going to use your R of B relative to A. So looking at mapping these, and again, I ended up on this one having an omega opposite my alpha. Now there isn't an easy way on this one to find an ICZV. The reason for that is that we don't know the path that B is moving, okay? We do um, easily enough know that my velocity of A absolute is going up, right? And that's basically to make sure that this omega and that V are pushing in the same direction. Um, the other thing I can observe is I have relative omegas uh, and relative alpha, right? So if I want to find my absolute, which I need for my equation, we know that the omega of AB is equal to the omega of OA plus my omega of AB. Sorry, get that. AB relative to OA. So numerically, if this was equal to two and this one was equal to four, noting that this one is negative from the right hand rule, right? Wrapping your fingers around. This other one is also negative from the right hand rule. I would end up with an omega of AB equal to negative six. And these are always gonna be in radians per second. Okay, so basically B is moving even faster around O than A is moving around O because we have this additive motion. Um, and again, you can't really um, document the direction of the velocity of B, but you can do the relative, right? So if we have the omega going in the same direction here as this relative angular velocity, so that's going to be my omega thumb into the screen, rotate into that R vector. This would be my velocity of B relative to A right? Relative fixed axis rotation around A, like A was a fixed axis point. So basically what you'll be doing for finding your total is adding together these two vectors. Adding this one to this one would give you your total velocity at A. But in our mapping exercises, I don't expect you to um, go through that part of it. But I did want to find those velocities because then they also then inform my 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 tangential accelerations, right? So again, omega opposing alpha, therefore my acceleration of point A tangential is going down. And then my acceleration of A relative to B, because again here I assumed that, now this isn't always true, but I did it for this one that I had my omega opposing my alpha, therefore I ended up with like a large negative omega and it ended up with a larger positive alpha, right? Because this one is positive from the right hand rule. This is further positive from the right hand rule. Therefore, my acceleration adding those two together is going to be even bigger positive. And that's the one I would cross into this R vector in order to get that um, tangential acceleration. So this is acceleration of A relative to B tangential. Now to add in my normals, I would have my acceleration of A normal and my relative is here, my acceleration of A relative to B normal. So the mapping process on additive motion is actually a little easier in a certain way because you don't have to have these terms, these absolute accelerations at B. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, sorry. Did we switch notation for A relative to B versus B relative A, like the accelerations and the velocities at point B? Or did I miss something? Is that like... Oh, good catch. Yeah, those should be, just like my R vector, they should be B relative to A. Sorry, I was just, I was trying to hurry, and that's what I get for hurrying is... These should both be... B relative to A, because the accelerations at A relative to B would come out of A.
and would require my, nor my, my R vector to flip. Thanks for catching that, Zach. Okay, so and then just to finish this out, filling in the equation, we have our alpha of OA. The R vector here is going to be the R of A. I could add it here as a, just so I have all the vectors drawn. This is my R of A, which is the same thing as my R of A relative to O, because point O doesn't move. Uh, the next term here is my normal of A. And so this is going to be the omega of OA. And then my R vector, again, is going to be my R of A. So basically, these two terms are this one and this one. And then these next two terms are going to be this one and this one. And so now this is looking at the absolute acceleration and absolute omega. And so this would be my alpha of AB, my R of B relative to A, and my omega of AB, and my R of B relative to A. All right, so I know I blew completely over time. And I see that about half of you are still with me. I appreciate your time and, 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 and learning effort on this. Um, I'm still open for questions and I'll stick around for another five minutes or so to answer any questions. I guess uh, my first question is uh, alpha of AB, have we drawn that yet? Uh, we haven't, but we could. We have this, um, We've added, we have the relative around point A. And like I said, because both these are positive, we could write the equation that alpha of AB is equal to, and these are all technically, they're technically vectors, but they're all in the k-hat direction in a 2D problem. So these ones you can actually get away with a scalar formation as long as you pick up the sign from the right-hand rule. But like I said, these are technically all vectors. I should write them and such. So, um, so this is going to be the alpha of OA plus my alpha of, yeah, AB relative to OA. And so this is going to be a large positive, and so positive could be drawn. But the second part of the acceleration equation that's like highlight or like underlined in yellow highlight there, shouldn't that be alpha of AB with respect to OA? And likewise, great, OA, qu great question. Like no, then, so both of these, perfect question, thank you for that. These two terms must be absolute. If you're struggling to see that, let me show you here quickly. I think that I, um, let's see, I got a, change this so we're going to do a stop screen share. I don't know if it's worth I I will um uh, I will put there's a PDF that I created a couple of years ago that talks through that exact detail of why those have to be absolutes versus relatives. Um I will put that into um Monday of this I'll I'll put it in under today's that makes sense. Um I'll link it under today's module um, right after class. Um, but fundamentally, we need to be using absolute omegas um, for every single, it doesn't matter if it's your, um, you know, the omegas of the fixed axis body, so those for point A or those for B, but they have to be absolute. And it, it comes down to that the motion of AB is not just based upon that arm, but it's, it's, it's adding on the motion of the rest of the body. And so it's this, like I said, I, I drew it all out to show you in equation form how these, these things need to be absolute because it is this additive motion and we're adding together um, the angular motion to get out to point B. Cool, thank you, Dr. B. You bet. Other questions? on this relative acceleration. If we wanted to draw the absolute, like the acceleration of B and the velocity of B, you would just do vector addition of like 
VBA plus VA? That's correct. Yeah, you would find that if you really wanted to see what that looks like, and 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 you draw, and you know, you had drawn things somewhat to scale. You know, you could add on VA here, right, and find that your VB would look something like that. And technically, you could add together all of your tangent and normal accelerations at point B, tip to tail, tip to tail, tip to tail, tip to tail, and end up with your total acceleration vector. You could also, if you wanted to leave it in component form, you could add together, well, you couldn't do that because your tangents and normals are in different directions. So you'd have to add them all together and get your total, and then you convert it into like X, Y components. Um, and just a reminder on all this that when we feed an equation, right, if all of these R vectors are in X, Y, we end up with, like automatically, all the tangent normal becomes X, Y, okay? So there's not like an additional conversion you need to do, even though, like, like I said, the basis of all of these different terms are tangent normal components. As long as we always feed them X, Y, R vectors, that conversion is done for us. So that's, that's a convenient thing. And if we were trying to find, like, say, the x, y absolute acceleration, like you said, from that tangent normal component, that's probably where we want to be careful with predictions because obviously if you're adding vectors in opposite directions, like magnitudes are going to start to be really important. Yeah, like the velocity one's easy enough because you're just adding two vectors to get a third. The acceleration, you're adding four vectors to get a fifth. Um, so, you know, also realize that when you add together everything on this right side over here, it's going to kick you out an acceleration of point B in X, Y coordinates, right? Because that is, you know, everything on the right hand side has been expressed in terms of X, Y. Um, it would be actually really hard to convert it into tangent and normal because you'd have to figure out what direction tangent and normal are going. Um, tangent would be easy enough because you could line it up with VB and then I guess normal you could point it toward I mean, you have to figure out the path and the curve, but just know that like, it's this that you'd be looking for. So just to make sure I'm understanding, like, if we solved everything on the right, we're going to basically get a vector with two, like, an X component and a Y component? That's correct. So even though, so like, when we're, as, a, as like a solving strategy, we can say, you know, we can break that left side into T and N. Um, but but right really we're is that just for like setup for like drawing your vectors because really we're going to get an x y vector out. Yeah, it'd probably be more appropriate on a additive motion problem not even to think about your acceleration of b and t and n components, but really think about it as your your total acceleration of b that's going to actually come out in x y coordinates because all your r vectors have been in x y. Now you could technically flip around A and B. Um, it just then loses that logic of all the stuff on the right is equal to the left. And you end up basically kind of coming back in toward point A. Um, computationally, you can still get the same answer. Um, but structurally, I like this idea of building out to point B. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you for the clarification. You bet. Let's see. And Hassan had a question here a bit ago. I don't even know if he's still on of the 306. We wanted to draw the absolute velocity of B and try to relate the velocity of the to B, B, go up along. I guess that's what I did here in my drawing. So that, that actually, I think I covered that. That the total VB is the addition of VB slash A plus VA. Okay. Well, we are officially 25 minutes over, um, which you should know that could happen on these kinds of topics. Um, on the next two sections we cover on Friday and Monday, actually it's only one section when we cover velocities one day, accelerations the next day. And so um, this 16.7 is very challenging stuff. 
To be honest, we're going to add more terms to these equations. We're going to add one more term to the relative velocity equation, which I call a slipping term. We're going to add three more acceleration terms. And so the, ba the big difference between 16.7 and 16.8 is in 16.7, noting that we're still writing this equation for two points that are on the same body, right? A and B. Every single acceleration term in this big, ugly equation is related to either A, B, or the relative motion between them. 16.8, we, we introduced this idea of slipping. Now, one nice thing about it is that if we have movement between rotating bodies, that we have to let something else simplify in order to allow that movement. So even though we're like adding technically three terms, it's actually pretty much impossible to have a 16-8 style problem with all of the acceleration terms. There will always be things that go to zero, um, but you do need to figure out how to have them go to zero. So like I said, chapter 16, it's a tough chapter. Um, I believe in all of you that we can work through this. Um, you definitely have to understand what's going on in 16-3 to then 16-5 and 6 to 16-7 and then finally 16-8, kind of build up through the topics. Um, Please reach out if you have any questions. I see there's just four of you left. Appreciate your time. And can I can I ask one really really quick question? Um, yeah. For the uh, assignment on Monday, the mapping vectors, it says that the solution would be posted, and I'm trying to find that. Oh, I'll get that posted. I may not have. Um, yeah, I have it all together. I just need to to put it up there. So I've got. Okay, sweet. I've got Thank two you. things I was gonna do. Let me write these down so I don't forget them. I said I was gonna put up that. Um, additive motion description. And then the LE mapping solution. Okay, got it. Yep. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You're welcome.